Hello, I'm Anthony. Welcome to the GeForce Mtron Pro 4 tutorial. The invention of the Mellotron was one of the great watershed moments in the history of electronic music. It's a really incredible design. And if we're using an instrument like this, we're really sympathetic with those fundamental principles of uh, synthesis. And we're not just regurgitating presets that are given to us and using this as a preset bank. With the Mellotron, we want to feel a little bit of that authenticity that we get from such a beautiful vintage instrument. Hope you enjoy this video today and check out the Patreon and channel member links below if you'd like to help support my channel to carry on making content like this. Now this is preset number one. When you first load the instrument, you're gonna get Warm Flutes 4. But for the first time in the history of YouTube, um, somebody talking about the Mellotron is not going to play an excerpt from Strawberry Fields Forever. Obviously this is the sound though. What we have there is basically two Mellotrons playing side by side. You see layer A and B. So you have two basically separate instances of the uh, plugin engine, and we can toggle between them by clicking A and B. When you're looking at layer A, all of the controls will be lit green and red for B. And what you're hearing there is a faithful replication of the actual Mellotron sound. The original Mellotron contained magnetic tape that would run for up to eight seconds upon which could be stored a sample. So in this particular case, somebody sampled a flute at each of the pitches in the available keyboard. Can you see that the keyboard is actually currently restricted because the original Mellotron, is, its lowest note was a G, which is why these extended keys have been kind of hidden from us to once again, you know, and emphasize that authenticity. So we've got this eight second sample that every time we press a key, you're going to hear. Now I'm gonna press this key, listen to it, and you'll hear the actual physical variations in the recorded tape. And that, I've still got my key held down, but that's it, the tape's finished, it's finished playing back. Did you hear that little crack at about maybe three and a half seconds? That's again, simply a replication of what was, what, what was originally there. And this is a really important thing about this emulation. Uh, the GeForce have basically attempted as much as possible to be completely faithful to the original design. And I think that's a great thing. If I'm playing with a plugin like this, rather than one of the modern digital, all seeing, all dancing workstations, I want to feel that authenticity. At this point, I'm going to step back an even further level. I'm going to make it a single mono instrument. So it's a pure replication of a single Mellotron. I'm going to press the little S button on layer A so that now layer A is soloed. Now when I press a key, you'll only hear um, the left hand side because at the moment those two different flute sounds in layer A and B were being panned at hard left and right. If I double click on the pan slider now we're hearing a single instance of the Mellotron exactly as it was originally uh, implemented. And there's that little crack again that we heard so that's the sample being replayed each time. Now in the context of how to play a Mellotron authentically, I think it really helps to understand what's actually going on under the hood. We've got these strips of tape, as I say, capable of playing about eight seconds worth of sample. And at the bottom of each tape, it wasn't round on a reel and it didn't, it didn't have the capacity to loop. It was simply dragged over a playhead by a, a flywheel. So you've got this flywheel spinning uh, in the device constantly. And each time you press a key, a pinch roller would grab the tape corresponding to the key that you pressed and drag it across this playhead. And at the bottom of the piece of tape, you've got this long kind of stretch of tape. At the bottom of it was a spring so that when you let the key go, the spring would pull the tape back into place. So vertically um, in, the, in the body of the instrument itself, you had all of these strings of tape that were being dragged across the playhead. What that means is that if you play a key twice quickly enough, it's not had an opportunity to get back to its start position before the next time when you press the key, it begins to play. And that, that's been replicated with the rewind function. You see this little rewind button, it's currently on. So every time I press a key, we get the, 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 the very beginning of that sample sound. But if I play that key multiple times, we're actually moving forwards through the sample constantly. Now we can artificially affect where the key begins to play that piece of tape. So you've got this eight second stretch of tape. 
we can actually fast forward through part of it. If I pick up this attack start slider and move it all the way up to the top, if I click on it, you can see layer A attack start is set to two seconds. So we can basically jump forwards a quarter of the way through the tape. So now if I press this note, you're gonna hear that noise crackle a little bit sooner. There it is. Now that we understand what attack start does, if I throw this preset away and get to the original as loaded, if we jump between layers A and B, have a look at the attack start slider, and they're very slightly different between layers A and B. So this is effectively a functionally identical sound, the sound's being played twice, but by offsetting them, we're playing that sample back at slightly different times. So by setting the attack start on layer B a little bit later, it's just those few, what is it, 0.06 of a second is enough to really thicken this sound out and make it sound much more interesting. In addition to the, the offset, the attack offset, we've also panned them left and right, and now we get that much thicker, warmer sound. As opposed to soloed and pan central. It's a very beautiful sound all on its own, but when you've got two of them playing against each other, it really enhances the effect. Now, because this is an old piece of tape on an old piece of equipment, none of it works perfectly. The flywheel that's spinning isn't going to spin perfectly quickly. The capstan, which is the metal rod that runs through um, the machine, that's the thing that's going to kind of grip the tape machine and drag it along, that might be slightly offset. All these different mechanical components are going to produce an effect called wow and flutter. Now these are two pitch based effects and the only difference between wow and flutter really is that wow is slow and flutters fast. But really they are a family of pitch variant effects. If I increase wow you're going to hear a greater oscillation of the pitch over time. So there it is flat. I'm actually going to solo just layer A so that we can concentrate on this sound. Can you hear it slowly oscillating? And we can affect the speed of that wow by just increasing the rate a little bit. The oscillation will be faster now. Obviously, this is at extreme levels. Subtle is usually best with things like this. Flutter is the faster variant of the effect. And again, it has its own rate knob, so that's really quite a fast oscillation now. A little bit of each of those just increases that sense of kind of aged authenticity. And then you can introduce further instability on that, basically randomizing that wow and flutter to even further enhance the effect. We can play the entire sample backwards. Let's bring those down. And now we'll reverse the flute sample. So it's going to start playing from the end of the tape backwards. And because at the end of the tape, we had very significant kind of distortion of the sound, break up and, and warbling of the, of the tape, getting all that right at the very beginning. Now let's say we want to play the tape backwards to get that kind of interesting effect, but we don't want that crack right at the very end slash beginning of the sound. Or we can increase the attack start to basically jump over the bit that we don't want to hear. So it's still playing backwards, but we've just jumped over the first second of what is effectively the end of the tape. And then finally, we can halve the speed. So I'm playing the same note all the time here, but if I press half speed, it's going to drop it by an octave. Because now the tape is passing over the playhead at half the speed. I would need to play up an octave higher to get back to my C4. But as you can hear, there's a different tone now because obviously the tape's not designed to be played at that speed. We're gonna get a different effect. All of this stuff, if you paid the thousands of pounds that an original Mellotron would have cost you, they, they did subsequently drop their price over the years in the, from the late 60s into the early 70s, but they were still a very expensive piece of equipment. Part of the reason why these things are so beloved is because music, musicians were very heavily invested in getting absolutely everything they possibly could out of this thing. You would, for instance, get musicians basically pressing down on the flywheel that was connected to the motor in order to artificially introduce wow and get that kind of, you know, oscillating, slowing down and speeding up effect. 
let's load up a new preset and we'll have a different sound. Let's go to the classic violins. So what I've basically just done here is I've virtually toggled a switch that doesn't actually exist in this emulation because it's kind of pointless. In the original devices, there was a, a, a three-way switch that allowed you to select one of three different sounds from this tape cartridge that was stored in the machine. And this was incredibly ingenious. What it literally did was just move all of the playheads either to the left or the center or the right, and it would record and it would read back a different part of the tape. So each strip of tape had three different sounds on it, and where you move this toggle selector would determine which of the sounds was played back. So we've now kind of virtually switched from flute into violin mode, and we're playing back a different sound from the cartridge. Now this is where my emotional center lies because I'm a huge King Crimson fan, and this is straight from early Crimson. In order to get a really authentic Crimson sound, we can dip into the effects bank. Let's have a quick look over here. In the amplifier section, we have a saturate knob. If I turn that up, we're basically adding distortion into the sound. And this is something that fans of the likes of uh, In the Course of the Crimson King will be very familiar with, but I'm now way too loud. Let me just turn down a bit. incredible sound that is it's just absolutely beautiful let's turn that back down again so here's our violin sound let's carry on having a look at the instrument so we're going to head into a filter bank let's have a look at the filter we have three different types of filter modes low pass or high cut i'll say low pass this is a high pass and this is a band pass filter so we're currently set in high pass mode if i turn the cutoff knob you'll hear low frequencies being cut and we're only left with the high stuff Oh, I'm only actually affecting layer A here. Now, this was an accident, but it's a perfectly happy one. So at the moment, I've got layer A selected. When I turn that cutoff knob, I was only affecting layer A. Layer B's got its own setting, and you can see it's very slightly different now. If I press the link button, I'm going to edit both layers simultaneously. Now, when you enter link mode, every option in this, um, in this synthesizer, and you've now seen them all turn blue, they're all linked, but until I turn any single control, they're going to maintain their individual settings. So if I now move the cutoff knob, let's set it to 12 o'clock, both layers A and B will have been set to that. But if you have a look at the pan, for instance, that's still retained its, its original setting until I enter link mode, do something with the pan, and now both of the pan options would be whatever it was when I was linked. So let's set the pan back to stereo re-enter link mode and have a play with the filter, filter cutoff again. So there's me throwing low frequencies away and bringing them all back in and we'll switch into low pass mode and now we're retaining the low um, frequencies and throwing the high stuff away. And you can see that in the spectrum analyzer below. There we go. Band pass basically chooses whatever the cutoff value is, 1068. It's going to accentuate or allow those frequencies through and throw everything away on either side. That's quite a gentle filter in this instrument. Even when you turn all of the settings up to be quite extreme, you'll find that you never get to the point where you're completely throwing things away. If we head back into low pass filter mode, I'll just demonstrate that a bit more. We'll get to the stage where my cutoff is doing its thing. You can see those high frequencies being thrown away. Now, as I increase resonance, you would expect to see um, a spike, a filter spike at, we're currently set at two kilohertz here. Let's have a go. So at maximum, you can see it's just popping up. It's this frequency spike here. That's my two kilohertz resonant peak. That's a very gentle resonant peak. This isn't an extreme filter. Some filters in other um, synthesizers would just basically completely dominate, even get to the point where they self-oscillate. But the filter circuit in the Mellotron is quite gentle. Next along, we have a filter envelope. So all of these sliders here are the filter envelope. You see the amount slider. Don't get confused into thinking that's the amount of filter that's going to be applied. As you've just heard there, the filter is permanently active 
um, the filter envelope allows you to introduce or take back away again that filter over a period of time. So if I increase the filter amount and the attack, which basically says how long is it going to take for this filter to kick in, now we're going to go from no filter up to maximum filter over a period of time, four and a half seconds in this case. When we get to the end, we hang out at the sustain level. The notes actually ran out there. But at the end of the attack period, we'll go through a decay where we'll go from whatever the, the maximum filter setting is, and we're going to decay down. Let's say we take two seconds decaying down to whatever the sustain level is. So if I bring my sustain down to zero, we're basically going to draw a mountain. We're going to go up through the filter sweep, and then we're going to come back down again over, what, six and a half seconds? And we finish our filter sweep just before we run out of sound, just before our eight second sample runs out. While we're going through that journey with the filter, we can also go through a sim similar journey with our volume. So the amplitude envelope generator, e.g., allows us to do more or less exactly the same thing. So I'll draw a very similar curve. We'll spend four and a half seconds going up, two seconds coming back down again, and we'll sustain down to zero. So we're going to basically throw the sound away using the envelope, the amplitude envelope, before the tape actually runs out. We've got a really gentle kind of controlled descent down to zero volume using the, uh, the envelope generator. Now let's have a look at the LFO. So this stands for low frequency oscillator. And what we can do with the LFO is assign a wave shape to one of four different destinations. I'm gonna right click where it says pitch and here are our options, pitch, filter, pan, and level. You can also cycle up and down using these little arrows. So if I choose pitch, because it's a really easy one to demonstrate, the depth knob is gonna determine how much work the LFO does on the pitch according to this rate. So I've single clicked on the rate knob. Let's set the rate to 1.2 seconds, that's fine. So now if I increase the depth, so you can hear that pitch going up and down. I pull the depth way down so it's a little bit more subtle. Increase the rate. And we can also smooth out that sine wave to make it slightly less dramatic as it's going up and down and also have that effect fade in. Now we're at kind of sound effects levels here, but if I do a little bit more kind of work on getting it a little bit more subtle. I'm just going to pull away the, the filter and the envelope generators as well so that we can hear what's going on a bit more clearly. Now we've got a more gentle oscillation of the pitch, not quite so uh, dramatic. Let's apply that LFO to the filter instead. And now the filter cutoff is going to get oscillated. And that was the fade in taking effect. So it took a second or so for the filter to actually kick in before we heard the effect. I've made lots of changes to this sound. I'm just going to reload the violins back in again. Now I'm going to engage the break button. So the bottom right hand corner of the interface, I'm going to click break. I've now assigned my modulation wheel to the brake function. And what it basically does is it slows the motor down. It's like basically pressing your hand against the flywheel and slowing it right down. So if I press a note, so that's my mod modulation wheel turned up to about halfway. And that's all the way, all the way down again. Now you'd break your Mellotron if you did that, but it's a really cool effect. You can also apply that break effect to after touch. So let's bring in some of it over there. So I've turned my uh, modulation wheel all the way down to zero now. I'll press a key and then press into the after touch. Similar kind of thing with the filter. Let's have some after touch on the filter.
what I'm basically doing there is I'm high cutting using the current fit cutoff point as my starting point. And every time I press into the key, it's as if I'm doing this, virtually turning the cutoff knob up. On the bottom left of the device, we've got some controls that appeared on the original Mellotron. Here's our overall volume control, really straightforward stuff. A master tone control, and also master pitch control. And that'll do us for the basic tour of the interface. Hope you enjoyed this video. Look out for the advanced video next time when we dive a little bit deeper under the hood. Have a look at some of the more esoteric options in this instrument. Hope you enjoyed this one today. Please hit like if you did. I'll see you next time. Thanks very much.